one of the most disastrous, if not the most disastrous, acquisitions to take place in the history of U.S. railroading must be that of Guilford Transportation's acquisition of the DNH. Had this acquisition worked out, it would have provided yet another way of trains going from Maine all the way down to Washington, D.C., providing more competition to the mega railroads such as CSX and Norfolk Southern. Instead, it became yet another example in U.S. railroading of what not to do in these sort of circumstances. To gain a good understanding as to what happened with this merger and why it was so disastrous, as well as just how volatile it was for the Northeastern Railroads of the United States during the late 60s to mid-70s, we need to take a detailed look at both of the merger parties as well as another railroad that will come up constantly in the history of this merger, the Penn Central. This was a highly infamous attempt to combine the New York Central Railroad with the Pennsylvania Railroad. These two railroads had trackage that paralleled each other and or ran nearby each other in the same general territory. The concept of the merger was simple. Get rid of the duplicate trackage and allow for one lean, mean fighting machine to dominate that area of U.S. railroading. The two corporate cultures of these railroads, the New York Central and the Pennsylvania, couldn't have been further apart. The New York Central Railroad had been for the longest time in debt because of its lack of modernization. That's where this gentleman comes in. His name is Alfred E. Perlman. Mr. Perlman had been brought aboard the company by the then chairman, Robert R. Young, to modernize it and help it adapt to a new future. Passenger trains, for example, were becoming less and less profitable. Freight trains, on the other hand, were becoming the new bread and butter of the current existing railroads of that time. But the more critical issues that would be focused upon were to make the company more efficient in general. For example, the New York Central still had a four-track main line, which even by this point in the mid to late 50s was beginning to look increasingly outdated, as new technologies such as CTC or Central Traffic Control would allow a two-track main line to perform just as effectively as a four-track main line, with of course the reduced maintenance from having two fewer tracks. In addition to the increased technology utilized, the main reason why this particular setup allows for this incredible achievement is that all of the dispatching is done in one location. Therefore, the dispatchers can see trains throughout the network and make decisions on one train compared to another one thousands of thousands of miles away from each other. Let's take for an example a scenario where we have three trains two southbound and one northbound. The two southbound trains are right on top of each other, just within one or two blocks away. And let's say that the northbound train is a few blocks further away, but obviously traveling against the two in the opposite direction on the northbound track. Now let's say that one of the two southbound trains, the one leading the other, develops a mechanical failure and is forced to stop. This would, of course, cause, at least in the initial phase, the other southbound train behind it to stop as well. In the case of a four-track mainline and with a basic block signaling system, the only thing that could be done here is if there is a second track going in the same direction, is to divert that particular train, the one that is now being held up by the broken down train, onto it. Again, this requires that the railroad has four main lines, two in each direction for it to be accomplished. In the case of CTC, however, this is not necessary. The dispatcher can, because the other northbound train is still or far enough distance away, transfer the southbound train that is now stuck behind the broken down southbound train, as long as there's a crossover between it and the northbound train, onto the actual northbound tracks to get around the broken down train. Once clear of the broken down southbound train, it can then be transferred back onto the southbound tracks to also allow it to clear the northbound train, which if necessary can even be halted in place to allow this to happen. This essentially allows a double track mainline to function just like a quad track or four track mainline without the expense of maintaining two extra tracks, saving the company a lot of money in the process. And yes, while the signaling system may cost money, it costs nowhere near as much as maintaining the extra two sections of track. And remember, there's already a basic block signaling system in place on the four track main line. And therefore, the railroad would still have to pay for signaling regardless of whether this was done or not. This innovation was one of the many tricks that allowed the New York Central to reduce its deficit by half in just a few years. Another innovation done by Perlman to make the New York Central more efficient was to install computerized marshalling yards. This would allow the trains to be switched electronically via computer, requiring less staff intervention and less manpower and or woman power to function, allowing the railroad to basically get twice as many trains switched with half as much labor and with half the expenses, thus improving efficiency and reducing overhead all in one shot.
Now, while it is true that these innovations could be costly, a long section of the CTC system, as described before, cost the New York Central over $6 million to install, they would have massive savings in the long run. As they would reduce, again, as mentioned before, the overhead of the company by drastically reducing maintenance and labor costs. These innovative and modernized ideas implemented by Perlman on the New York Central allowed the company to achieve profitability and eventually led it to being several million dollars in the black before the company was merged into the Penn Central. Unfortunately, this could not be said for the Pennsylvania Railroad. In sharp contrast to the New York Central, the company was obsessed with its sport track main line. The company's president at the time, Stuart T. Sanders, basically resisted change, all change, including making things more efficient. It also continued to insist upon its old-school block signaling system and refused to adapt to computer technologies until much later. This seemed to be the result of stubborn managers and presidents that just couldn't understand the concept of modernizing the company and seemed to have this bizarre notion that more traffic, even though the trends were going in the opposite direction at that time, would magically come out of nowhere and thus cause the company to suddenly need the four-track mainline again, making it unjustifiable to remove these tracks. Perhaps this was due to management not being able to grasp how the railroad industry had changed or perhaps this was all because the company simply couldn't leave its heritage behind. After all, the company had been known as, for the longest time, the Broadway for four tracks. Even though it had been already clearly proven that a dual-track CTC system would be much more efficient than the aging four-track system the Pennsylvania Railroad currently had. The company also couldn't seem to grasp the ideas that the computer technology and CTC technology would further improve efficiency as well as reduce overhead, something the Pennsylvania Railroad could clearly benefit from at that point as their deficits were beginning to rise. Frustratingly enough, these same issues were prevalent on both the Erie and Lackawanna Railroads before the Erie-Lackawanna merger took place. This in turn led to pretty much nothing getting accomplished, including the reduction of duplicate trackage and or elimination of that trackage and furthermore led to the company running into the red ink, and would eventually lead to its demise several years later. And yet, despite this very ominous and very clear warning sign that this sort of merger would not work out for the two railroads, the management of the New York Central and Pennsylvania Railroad decided to go ahead with the merger anyway. Things would get even more complicated at this point, as the ICC would demand that the Penn Central, as the company was to be known as, would take on the New Haven Railroad as part of the deal. The New Haven Railroad's main income stream came from that of passenger trains as well as the industries that were line signed to the line itself. These two streams of income had sustained the railroad up until that point. However, even with these two streams of income, the company still found itself in a state of perpetual bankruptcy since the Great Depression. On top of all of this, the times they were a changing in the railroad industry. By this point in the late 1960s, passenger trains were not profitable, but rather lead balloons pulling the companies down by the head. This was no exception on the New Haven line. Worse still, the New Haven's line-side industrial base companies were slowly but surely moving out of state, going out of business, or moving overseas. The end result, the company was pretty much down to just running commuter trains which again had to be run at a specific price set by the government, which not only prevented the railroads running them from making a profit, it also did not allow them to even break anywhere near even with the expenses required to operate these trains. In short, if the phrase giant anchor, essentially pulling the business down, hadn't been coined yet, it would have been coined by the New Haven Railroad, as this was an exact definition of what that railroad was becoming and or was at that time. Despite this new issue and the other issues previously discussed, the management of the New York Central and Pennsylvania Railroads decided to go ahead with the merger anyway. And so the merger of the New York Central Railroad, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the New Haven and Hartford Railroad was approved and took place in 1968. And needless to say, it was a complete and total disaster. The first year of the merger, the company found itself in debt to the tune of $2.8 million dollars. A second year of the merger was even worse, with this deficit reaching $83 million. And finally, in 1970, when the company finally had to declare bankruptcy, the debit had increased all the way up to $325.8 million. Shocking. One of the reasons for this situation deteriorating as rapidly as it did was infighting among the two companies and the two management teams, which was awkward in itself. 
Essentially, Perlman of the New York Central would come up with an ingenious way of saving money, like, say, installing a marshalling yard, which would contain the latest computer technology for the best efficiency. But his decision would be vetoed by Sanders, who would assume it would cost too much and refuse to grasp the fact that this might actually help the company in the long run by reducing the company's overhead and making it more efficient. Despite the fact that Perlman could back all of this up, with his own history running the New York Central and getting it back into profitability doing just such things. The end result of all this infighting was that nothing essentially got done, including the promised removal of duplicate trackage in some areas of the railroad to make it more efficient. On top of all of this, the ICC was ever more aggressive in trying to keep railroads in check. It was established back in the late 1800s, essentially the bad old days of railroads, when they were often laden with scams and corruption. An example of one of these scams, essentially a railroad line would be set up, the stock would be pumped up by the founders, and then as soon as the company stock had peaked to a certain point, the founders would leave the company selling their stocks, collecting their profit, and essentially disappearing, leaving what was left of the railroad to founder. This is among several of the KG practices being done by the railroads. However, by the 1960s and 70s, the ICC had successfully weeded out all of this corruption with aggressive regulations. Also, the railroads were no longer the same highly profitable operations as they were in the past, with high amounts of regulations pushing them down, as well as increased competition from cars and trucks for hauling goods and passengers across the United States. There was also the fact that transportation companies such as truck, bus, and eventually airlines didn't have to own and maintain the paths their equipment traveled on. In the case of cars and trucks, it was the highways, which were state-owned and maintained. In the case of airplanes, all they needed were airports, which were again state-owned and or government-owned and maintained. Railroads, on the other hand, had to do just that, owning every section of track, paying taxes on it, and maintaining it to standards for safety as well as operating purposes, all of which put them at a huge disadvantage this way. And yet, despite all this, the ICC still continued to be very aggressive and hostile toward any sort of railroad move. Mergers took years, in some cases, to be approved. Companies were forced to keep unprofitable branch lines in service, even if the company lost millions of dollars in the process for the sake of maintaining jobs. Commuter railroad lines that did not actually make profits were required to be run at ever lower cost to consumers. No matter how much deficit the host railroad company would have to incur to accomplish this. On top of all of these factors, the ICC had complete control over the rates the railroads were allowed to charge for haulage of cargo. This created twofold situations in which either A, the railroad couldn't necessarily break even with a rate they were being forced to charge, or B, railroads that could actually provide a service much cheaper than, say, a competing trucking line could not actually reduce their rates accordingly. They would instead have to deal with whatever rate the ICC decided was appropriate, which was always set without any input from the railroads, and little to no way for the railroads to actually appeal the decision these decisions were usually made also without most of the people involved with the ICC understanding how the business worked. This tone deafness certainly did not help the situation for the Penn Central. Worse still, by 1974, the reorganization court assigned to attempt to reorganize the Penn Central Railroad so it could come out of bankruptcy had declared after two years of work on the project that this simply was not possible based upon the company's revenue against its deficits. This caused a huge panic for all of the railroads in the United States, as even if the railroad, say, was located on the West Coast, especially now after the bankruptcy of the Erie Lackawanna, there would be no way to get traffic to the East Coast from the West Coast, or vice versa, essentially strangling the railroad industry. The end result of this was an emergency rescue done by Congress called Con Rail, or the Consolidated Railroad Group, in 1976. This newly formed company would take over the operations of the tracks of the Penn Central Railroad, as well as other railroads in the area that had recently gone bust, such as the Central New Jersey Railroad and the Erie Lackawanna. Then came the Staggers Act of 1980. This essentially limited the control of the ICC over the railroads, allowing the railroads to once again control the pricing for lines they operated, allowing them to compete more efficiently and effectively with truck lines, as well as allowing them to more easily abandon track sections that didn't make money for them and not forcing them to operate these in deficits. 
In addition to all of this, the commuter lines, which the railroads were being forced to operate at deficits, would eventually be flogged out to state-owned and or government-operated transportation corporations, thus removing a huge burden from the railroads back and allowing them to thrive much more easily. It is with all this deregulation that the Guilford Rail System, owned by Guilford Transportation, came into existence in 1981. The business plan of the Guilford Rail System was really quite simple. Acquire a bunch of bankrupt railroads along the east coast of the United States, eventually reaching down to Florida. Operate them on a tightest budget as possible, utilizing deregulation to get the overhead as low as possible, as well as acquiring second-hand equipment from other railroads. Again, an attempt to keep expenses and deficits to a minimal. This would prove a delight to rail fans as the company would quickly develop a reputation for having a very diverse roster of locomotives. Until well into the 1990s, everything from EMDs to GEs to even Alcos could be found in active service on the Guilford system pulling trains. Unfortunately, the company would not maintain this equipment to the highest of all standards, the letter, not the spirit. Concept again, keeping the maintenance prices down as low as possible. To that end, highly expensive repairs and or time-consuming repairs were avoided as much as possible. If it was determined that a locomotive's repairs simply weren't worthwhile, the engine would be scrapped. Parts utilized to keep a similar type locomotive on the rails and pulling trains for the company. In short, the cheapest option was usually always chosen. Again, this is part of the company's business plan, keeping its expenses at an all-time low as well as its overhead by choosing the cheapest option possible. This also meant keeping labor rates as low as possible, which would cause a lot of friction among the companies this company would eventually acquire. In 1981, Guilford would kick off its new railroad empire by acquiring the profitable Main Central Railroad. This company would remain the only profitable division of the Guilford Rail System for quite some time. This would be followed in 1983 by the Boston and Maine. Also included in the Boston and Maine transaction was a little known company that had long since essentially failed to exist other than on paper called the Springfield Terminal. The Boston and Maine had acquired the Springfield Terminal to give it access to a few small industries located up in Vermont. The Springfield Terminal would play a rather infamous part in Guilford's future as it continued to expand further southward. It is certainly fair to say that the company did make some moves to make itself look different amongst the railroads at the time, which even with deregulation and the ever-rising Conrail Corporation, were still being viewed as out-of-date, old-fashioned, and unnecessary. Guilford, for example, repainted a lot of its equipment around this period in time to the new paint scheme the company had devised. A dark gray with an orangey, yellow, or tangerine metallic style stripe with a stylized white G with an arrow pointing up. that was nicely blended in to be a part of the G itself. The company also ran several publicity runs featuring aging bud passenger equipment from the golden age of American passenger railroads, pulled by its own very clearly decorated Guilford equipment to promote the whole concept of this company being a new direction for railroads in the United States and in general trying to draw attention to the railroads, which for the longest time were sort of falling out of favor with Americans in general. In addition to deregulation making railroads like Conrail highly successful, there was the fact that fuel prices had become highly unstable. The country was going through yet another fuel crisis in the early 80s, and prices began to skyrocket to the then shocking price of over $1 a gallon. Therefore, there began to be a resurgence in interest in railroads in general in terms of moving bulk commodities to save on fuel prices, as rail lines tend to be more efficient in doing such things. And Guilford seemed determined to tap into this momentum to help promote itself as a new way forward. For railroading in the United States at that time.
The stylized G, again done in a very contrasty white color, which appears to show the railroad turning around and then moving up, indicating it's going places, seems to be indicative of this. And going places the company was. By 1984, the company was ready to make its next acquisition. A railroad that had been a bright star in the otherwise dark and gloomy environment that was Northeastern Railroading at the time, the Delaware and Hudson, or D&H for short. Through all the turmoil of railroads going bankrupt left and right in the early 70s, the D&H remained stable as well as profitable. The company had a long history of planning ahead and making very smart financial decisions. A good example of this was after World War II, with coal becoming increasingly unpopular as a way of heating people's homes, and of course the rise of oil for this particular usage, the company quickly began a transition as a quote bridge carrier. This is to say, instead of focusing on online generated traffic, this is to say cargo generated on its main line, which was mainly anthracite coal, the company would instead focus on connecting companies on either end of its territories, moving traffic along those sections or bridging them. In addition, the DNH always had excellent public relations, especially in the era of its beautiful lightning strike paint scheme, as featured here, which was two-tone Lake Champlain blue with a gold stripe and gray. And of course, the famous DNH gold shields. This unique and highly attractive paint scheme continues to stop rail fans in their tracks to this day. Further making the company very attractive to rail fans was the fact that until the late 1960s, the Delaware and Hudson ran with a solid Alco roster. Indeed, the DNH was one of the larger companies that stuck with Alco long after the company met its demise in 1969. Much to the again delight of rail fans who got to witness these beautiful machines and this attractive lightning strike paint scheme rolling by. It can easily be surmised that the reason for the DNH's excellent luck with its fleet of Alcos was the fact that the company always made maintenance a priority. The tender loving care these machines received allowed them to stay in service much longer than any other railroad, including the Class 1s, were able to keep their Alcos in service at the time. Further assisting the DNH through this time and its prosperity was the fact that the company had great employee relations. Unlike the Erie Lackawanna and Penn Central giant mergers that had failed miserably, due mainly to a massive amount of infighting within those companies, and the feeling of being part of a massive octopus of a company, the DNH felt very much down to earth and homely. Most of the employees knew each other and were on a first name basis, and this extended all the way up to upper management. It was this feeling that everyone was rolling the boat together that kept the company rolling down the track. In addition to all of this, the company managed to really hit a lot of positive notes, especially in the late 60s, when many railroad companies were getting out of the passenger service. While initially testing the waters about cancelling its two passenger train services, in which the company was down to by the mid-1960s, the Montrealer, which ran overnight, and the Laurentian, which was its day train, which at the time were propelled by RS2 type Alcos equipped with steam generators. The company then announced its intentions to upgrade these particular services with now ex Santa Fe Alco PAs that were on the market. Plus used passenger cars it would acquire from several different sources including the Rio Grande. All of which would be refurbished and upgraded. And with this, the DNH acquired the four X Santa Fe Alco PAs, as well as a fifth for parts to keep them going. The locomotives maintained their old troublesome 244 16 cylinder prime movers. In later years, and toward the end of their career on the DNH, Morrison Kuritsen would get contracted to upgrade these PAs, and they would receive 12 cylinder 251F prime movers that actually made 200 horsepower more than the predecessor 16 cylinder 2. 44s that they replaced. Indeed, for years after passenger service was discontinued with the advent of the Amtrak turbo trains, the DNH would hang on to these engines as they were worth that much to it in terms of public relations. They essentially had become their mascots, hosting several public excursions, again open to the public for a fee, which was almost becoming a second business for the company, and occasionally utilizing them to pull freight trains. <laughs> 
After their time on the DNH, these engines had very strange lives. All winding up in Mexico, all were wrecked. Two were rebuilt in Mexico, while the other two were returned to the United States. One is being restored by the famous Doyle McCormick, the other by the Museum of the American Railroad. As beautiful as these four locomotives were, they were not the only rare locomotives that the DNH saved. And that brings us to the sharks in the room, if you will. In 1974, the DNH received a tip that the last two remaining Baldwin RF-16 sharks, former New York Central units that had most recently operated from the Mahunga Gila Railroad, were now up for sale and had actually already been sold for scrap. After some negotiations, the company managed to acquire the locomotives for nothing more than scrap and had laying around on its property. For the DNH, this was the deal of the century. For the price of some useless scrap metal it had laying around, it gained two very rare locomotives it could fix up, put into service, and at the same time use as promotional tools for its railroad because of their rarity. Or at least that was the plan. Unfortunately for the sharks, their age began to catch up with them and maintenance costs began to rise. Worse still, replacement parts were hard to come by as Baldwin was long out of business and the company that had taken over the rights to build Baldwin's old prime movers didn't quite have the ability to build parts that would fit them correctly, as it turns out. The end result, these locomotives lasted only four years until 1978, where they were sold to a private leaser. Unfortunately, the company they were leased to failed to care for the locomotives correctly, and the sharks soon developed severe mechanical problems, including a failed prime mover. The Sharks then eventually found themselves on the Escanaba and Lake Superior Railroad, initially for storage purposes, but when the original leaser was unwilling or unable to cover the storage costs, they were eventually sold to the railroad to cover them. Only one of these two Sharks would ever serve on the Escanaba and Lake Superior Railroad, specifically number 1216, on two separate occasions. The first not long after it was acquired, unfortunately, after repairing the traction motor, the crankshaft was scored. She was then rebuilt and put back into service in the early 80s. However, once again, prime mover issues developed, this time unfortunately sidelining the locomotive for good. Parts were purchased to rebuild the locomotive again, but this never happened due to cost prohibitive issues. Then in 2014, images of these locomotives appeared out of nowhere, seemingly, showing that they were in the same condition they were before put away nearly 30 years before. And in 2020, the owner confirmed that upon his death, they would be donated to a museum, although which one was never specified. Then in December of 2021, Unit 1216 made an appearance, having, by this point, sat in storage for nearly 40 years. The locomotive was then moved to another facility on the Escanaba and Lake Superior Railroad. Hopefully, she will be restored to her former glory soon. While one could certainly make the argument that the Delaware and Hudson's purchase of the RF-16 Sharks was not a smart one, at least in terms of a business sense, the fact of the matter was that shrewd decisions like this would keep the DNH going while all of its competitors continued to go bankrupt and in some cases out of business. By 1968, the Penn Central merger was finally approved and had gone through. Despite crazy stipulations such as demanding the Penn Central, the new combined company, take control of the New Haven Railroad and liability for it. The New Haven, again, was hopelessly in debt and had no hope of getting out of it, as none of its traffic paid the bills. All of it was being run at a deficit, as it mainly consisted of commuter traffic by that point. Despite this and the fact that the Pennsylvania Railroad had failed to take modernization steps to make it more efficient, such as getting rid of excessive tracks on the main line, which was still four tracks, even though it didn't need them anymore thanks to modern signaling systems and a reduction in traffic. Many railroads still feared the power of the Pennsylvania Railroad. The main fear now, as it was part of the New York Central system, that it would become a force to reckon with. And to that end, the DNH found itself cast into another fate. The still prosperous Norfolk and Western feared that if it didn't get control of trackage in some of the areas and territories served by the Penn Central Railroad, it would become obscure. And so it promptly began to put together a sort of war chest, if you will, of several smaller companies that had by this point fallen on hard financial times. The majority of these railroads could be bought for a very good price as they weren't doing well financially, and the stock prices were tumbling in railroads in general in the Northeast. 
The plan was then to unite all these companies together into one cohesive system after it had merged with the Chesapeake in Ohio, aka the CNO Chessy system, which also owned the Baltimore in Ohio by this point. To prevent the financial issues from these companies from sinking in and destroying the Norfolk and Western, the company decided to set up a holding company to buy and operate them called Direco. And two of the companies that it first acquired for this particular operation were the Erie Lackawanna and, of course, the Delaware and Hudson. Direco was also to acquire other bankrupt railroad lines in the Northeast, such as the Central New Jersey Railroad. Unfortunately, this never happened. The CNO Chessy system, despite being interested at first, balked at the idea of merging with the Norfolk and Western when it saw the condition of how the railroads were being run, specifically the high demands from the unions in the Northeast. This was a major issue, as the Chessy system was the essential linchpin of this particular merger, as it, in addition to having additional access to railroads in the South, also had access to railroads in the Northeast and toward the Midwest, thanks to its ownership of the B&O Railroad. This, needless to say, stopped Direco in its tracks, and no other companies but the Erie Lackawanna and the Delaware and Hudson were acquired. In 1972, the Erie Lackawanna, which had only managed to turn a profit once or twice after its massive merger, was devastated by Hurricane Agnes. With no capital left to rebuild, the Erie Lackawanna declared bankruptcy. Direco was in the process dissolved as its whole purpose for existing was a sacrificial lamb in case any severe financial issues cropped up on any of the other railroads. However, despite the fact that Direco was now gone, the Norfolk and Western still retained a good portion of ownership in shares in the D&H. And while these shares weren't quite enough for the Norfolk and Western to call themselves a controller of the D&H as a majority holder, they still had a lot of influence. In short, while the DNH became independent at this point, the Norfolk and Western still had at least a small hand on the throttle. Then things would get even more interesting. After the Penn Central failed and Conrail was formed in 1976, the DNH, due mainly to the fact that the Penn Central was so ineffective of transporting cargo at the time, had remained profitable and highly successful through this period meaning it was in something resembling fighting Schaefe to do battle with Conrail. As a result of this and its excellent public relations as mentioned earlier, and also to give the new Conrail system some competition, the DNH was granted trackage rights all over the actual Conrail network. In addition, to ensure that the DNH had the equipment to power this, these trains over these particular tracks, the company was given several locomotives from the companies that were used to make up the Conrail network. While this arrangement did work for a while, with the DNH maintaining its reputation for being a bright sun in the otherwise dark and cloudy and gloomy Northeastern Railroad set, things wouldn't last. With proper management, as well as deregulation such as the Staggers Act, Conrail began to right the ship, and slowly but surely improve the tracks and quality of service to its customers, building the company back up to closer to what it was before World War II when the company had reached its height. This began to suck all of the oxygen out of the room for the DNH. There was simply not enough business to sustain the company. Worse still, the Northeastern Union, specifically the DNHs, began to get more and more aggressive in salary demands. These components put together began to push the DNH over the falls. And what can only be called a highly ironic twist, what appeared to be the last straw for the DNH came from the Norfolk and Western. In 1980, the Norfolk and Western was looking to merge with the Southern Railroad. While this all seemed in order, there was one technical complication. Those shares the company still owned of the DNH. The ICC, despite its deregulatory mood it had been in for several years at this point, refused to allow the merger to go through unless the DNH shares were cast aside. Needless to say, this was a very simple decision for the Norfolk and Western to make. As by this point, the DNH showed serious signs of weakening, mainly due to the Conrail juggernaut that had successfully turned itself around and was now the force to be reckoned with that the company had always tried to be when it merged originally with the New York Central. Now, of course, the company had the Erie Lackawanna trackage on top of everything else and was beginning to really suck the oxygen out of the room, as mentioned before. Oh, that should go stop. 
This move would push the DNH's already precarious financial situation into, into a complete and total crisis. Enter Guildford Transportation. By this point, the Guildford rail system had already started up and was looking for financially troubled and or bankrupt railroads like the Delaware and Hudson to acquire. It was now the quite anonymous year of 1984. To this end, it bought the Delaware and Hudson system for about $500,000. The cheap price was as a result of the terrible physical and financial condition the railroad was in at that time. By this point in 1984, the Delaware and Hudson had so little traffic it was literally being kept alive by government grants. As it turns out, however, this acquisition would not go very smoothly, perhaps a sign of things to come. The DNH was in such bad financial condition that it could quite literally not afford to stay afloat during the whole negotiating and transactional process of the Guilford transportation system getting hold of the company itself. To save the company from going bust as this took place, Guilford offered to buy, via its main central division, all of the company's most recent acquisitions, in terms of motive power, which would be its U23Bs. These engines were acquired and were promptly put into service with the DNH shield replaced with the Pine Tree State logo. This transaction allowed the DNH to remain afloat while final terms of the sale were finalized and the transaction went through. The process was soon completed and it now appeared that there would be actual real competition for the Conrail system. Here was a new and innovative railroad company looking to take a whole bunch of bankrupt lines and turn them into one profitable mega system that could really give Conrail a run for its money. With its new attitude, its new paint, and new sort of economical way of looking at things. Unfortunately, as seemingly always in these cases, the optimism was misplaced. There were rough seas on the horizon, and Guilford Transportation was sailing right into them. It just hadn't realized that yet. The story so far. The late 1960s to mid-1970s was a very volatile time for railroads in the United States, specifically on the East Coast. Railroads formed in the late 60s, such as the Penn Central from the Pennsylvania Railroad and New York Central Railroad, and the Erie Lackawanna formed from the Erie and Lackawanna Railroads, failing not long after their original inceptions. These failures could be linked to infighting within these two mega companies, but also an ICC that was increasingly out of touch and seemed to be caught in a previous century. Continuing with an outdated and very bizarre at this point notion that the railroads were still somehow owned by robber barons and needed to be kept in their place by having their profits and business practices strongly monitored and otherwise curtailed and controlled. And certainly not the current century where at the time energy prices were skyrocketing giving transportation sector companies a hard time, and the railroads themselves being at a distinct disadvantage with companies like bus and truck lines not needing to own the roads that they operated on which were paid for them, not to mention airlines that didn't need to obviously own the air they flew in, nor even the airports they flew out of, these again being provided by local state governments who built and financed them as well as maintained them for the airlines themselves. This was coupled with other such failures, such as the Lehigh Valley Railroad and Central New Jersey, declaring bankruptcy within days after the bankruptcies of the Erie Lackawanna and Penn Central. Threatened to strangle the whole of the Northeastern Railroad Sept, as there was absolutely no lines with the exception of the D&H left to push traffic through. Big disaster as the West Coast Railroads would now have no way of sending traffic to the East or getting traffic from the East. The end result, Congress spent public money to form a private company called Conrail to operate the bankrupt companies. An intentional consequence of these particular companies being taken over by the publicly funded private company was that successful operations such as the DNH suddenly found themselves in financial destitute. As new deregulatory actions such as the Staggers Act removed crippling and out-of-touch regulations from these railroad companies, allowing them to finally demonstrate their full potential and essentially suck the air as an unfortunate byproduct out of the room, keeping other competitors from being able to breathe, essentially.
as these mega companies were able to provide better service and thus attract the business uh, that these other smaller outfits had away from them. These small companies, in short, could never compete with that. At the same time, these deregulatory actions inspired companies that were not involved in railroads to get into the railroad business, taking advantage of extremely favorable takeover and or buyout bids as these railroads were usually in major financial destitute and or debt. And utilizing the deregulatory dereg actions that Congress put in place to make these particular companies profitable and forces to be reckoned with. Enter Guilford Transportation's Rail Division, which would buy out the most of the main and main central railroads, putting them together into a cohesive system on the East Coast, seeking further expansion to make the company more profitable and have more territory. The company then chose to bid and buy out the DNH, which was by this point in financial destitute, due mainly to the now highly successful Conrail company that was now operating on all 12 cylinders and really starting to show its stuff. By this point, the DNH was in such a sorry state, it actually made more money off the government grants than it did hauling what little traffic it had left. Something had to change. And so, as mentioned before, Guilford Rand came to the rescue buying the company out for a total sum of $500,000. As it turns out, this wasn't actually going to be enough, as the financial situation was so dire on the DNH, it couldn't actually survive the whole process of the transaction going through. To ensure the company would remain afloat during the actual takeover process and as a gesture of goodwill, Guilford, via its main central division, bought all of DNH's U23Bs. These were the newest members of the DNH fleet and the most recent acquired before the financial turmoil had hit. While the exact price paid was never actually disclosed, the fact is, it worked out as a good deal for all sides. The main central, which was short of power, got a good deal on locomotives, and the DNH got to stay afloat during the takeover process. These engines were quickly put into service with the DNH shield painted out, and the Pine Tree State logo of the main central painted on top and in place. Initially, this merger looked like a match made in heaven. The DNH could finally break free of its perpetual financial turmoil, which the company had entered into not long after the whole Conrail Corporation had been formed, giving it stable financial ground. At the same time, Guilford, who bought the DNH, now would gain much needed trackage, allowing it to expand its business and become a force to be reckoned with and a successful competitor against Conrail. Unfortunately, to say this would not come to fruition was the understatement of the year. Guilford was hoping to attract a lot of new business to its lines thanks to the fuel crisis being experienced by the United States in the early 80s, specifically trucking companies and or the business from trucking companies hauling cargo from up and down the eastern seaboard. Unfortunately for Guilford, this just didn't work out. Not only did oil prices fail to reach the heights they were expected to in the 80s after the 1979 oil crisis, by 1985 they began to drop to lows that had not been seen since the early 70s in the United States. The end result, the trucking companies retained their business and or failed to utilize trailer on flat car or piggybacking of trailers on the Guilford system. Guilford also tried to attract more coal shipments on its line, as coal was still quite popular for powering power plants in some parts of the United States at this point in time, as it remains to a certain extent to these days. However, and unfortunately for Guilford, these shipments never materialized. In addition to the fact that the fuel crisis was short-lived, that the company was betting would increase the price of fossil fuels to the point where coal would once again become very popular as a source of energy, causing this to never actually take place, it seemed clear that the Conrail mega system was still too big and powerful for the now not so small Guilford rail system at 4,000 miles to take on and successfully get one over on. And so, in addition to not getting the coal traffic it was betting on, it also failed to wrestle any traffic away from the Conrail system. This in turn led to the company failing to bring its other two divisions, the DNH and the Boston and Maine, into profitability. The end result. The main central was the only actual money maker for the company and only marginally. The other two companies, the DNH and the Boston and Maine, never actually turned much of a profit, at least at this point in the company's history. Interesting note on the main central railroad, it was actually profitable when Guilford took it over and it remained as such.
The ironic thing now is it was the smallest part of the Guilford Transportation Network at only 840 miles, and it was the only division making money. The lack of income coming into the company also led to, to the company trying to find other ways of making it profitable, such as reducing its labor force. In 1984, the company began a string of layoffs, reducing its labor force from 5,100 to 4,500. These jobs cuts, while helpful, did not bring the company into the profitability range it was looking and the company continued to lose money on its Boston and Maine and Delaware and Hudson divisions. At the same time, they put more stress on the labor relations as well as between the unions and the company itself. Not good for the future of the company, to put it mildly. These stresses finally boiled over in 1986 as Guilford tried a new tactic in trying to get its company to be profitable by cutting the salaries of its workers. Specifically, in this case, the maintenance workers, who the company demanded a 20% pay cut from and accept responsibility for paying part of their medical insurance. This led the maintenance unions and a few of the other railroad units to go on strike, forcing Guilford to hire replacement workers as it refused to give in to the demands. The strike, at least due in part by the demands Guilford was putting on its workers in terms of salaries and pay cuts, spiraled completely out of control. By April, the strike had gotten so out of control that Boston area commuter trains were halted as well. This was due to the machinist union representing the MBTA going on strike in support of the Guilford workers, forcing the commuter system to shut down. This left MBTA rail commuters in the lurch and forced to look for other ways to get to work during this period. In addition, this strike set off what were referred to as sympathy strikes by other railroads such as the Santa Fe, Burlington Northern, and the Chesapeake and Ohio. All of these strikes put together threatened to grind the entirety of the railroad system in the United States to a halt. The final straw in this strike that got then-President Ronald Reagan involved occurred in April when the workers from the Guilford system began to protest on the Conrail stations in the area, shutting that system down. This in turn resulted by President Reagan establishing a committee to end the strike and ordering all the workers back to work, thus ending the strike on the Conrail system, but not as it turns out on the Guilford system, as many of the workers were not permitted to go back to work. The reasoning provided by Guilford at the time is that the strike had cost the company money and business, and as a result, it could no longer afford to have these employees on its payroll, and thus they were officially laid off. This, of course, led to more disputes. Guilford would, for a time, continue to hold strong to its demands, claiming that these demands would allow the company to become more profitable as well as all of the other railroads in the United States with the flexibility of the rules it was trying to get. However, after a few months of this, the company began to realize it was not going to be able to hold out for these particular rules and was thus forced to return to the bargaining table with the unions. Finally, in the summer of 1986, the strike was brought to an end after an excess of five months. The terms included a pay increase to the workers and somewhat more flexibility in the work rules as well as giving a share of ownership to the employees themselves, allowing the company more flexibility on assigning employees to the trains and as an closer toward an as-needed basis, but still not quite where Guilford wanted to be. Determined as ever to get what it wanted in terms of the concessions from its employees, Guilford looked for an alternative way of pushing these rules through, and it found it. Enter the company that was mentioned before, little known at the time, called the Springfield Terminal. This was a former inner urban that operated up in Vermont that the Boston and Maine had hastily purchased so it would continue to have access to several industries that company served. The company as at the time apparently in financial peril, and if it went out of business, the Boston and Maine would lose access to these tracks, at least for a time, while it negotiated to get the rights back, and so it decided to bite the bullet and purchase the company outright. The way it was acquired, however, allowed the Springfield Terminal to still exist on paper, even though it wasn't actually being operated by itself. It was being run by the Boston and Maine and now Guilford. Guilford, doing research on the subject, realized that with new deregulation laws, as well as the fact that this was a small interurban line, it could literally get everything it wanted in terms of concessions from its employees. All it had to do was essentially take the Maine Central, the Boston and Maine, and the DNH and lease them out to the Springfield Terminal. 
By leasing all of its lines to the Springfield Terminal, Guilford could get all the concessions including labor rules and rates it was looking for from its employees, essentially voiding all the union contracts it had. While neither the Boston and Maine or the Maine Central were happy with these terms, the DNH was in full-blown revolt. This in turn led the DNH division to go on strike. This, however, was a bigger disaster than the first strike. It caused the entirety of the company to grind to a halt, with a massive strike causing even the engineers to walk off the job. As a result, DNH trains of this period began to operate at as little as five miles per hour, as all the company could do for replacement employees were essentially trainee engineers, which again, as they were not certified for mainline operations, could only operate trains at these speeds. Now, forget a train being late by hours, it was quite possible during this period for a train to be delayed by days. The end result and or knock-on effect of this is that the Guilford Transportation Company lost more of its business yet again, as the shippers were not in the mood to wait extra days for their traffic to get to its destinations. Unlike the previous strike, Guilford refused to back down from its demands, demanding the unions expect, accept these new terms or essentially lose their jobs. The situation got so far out of control that the government once again had to get involved. In this case, though, there was no budging either side. Trains continued to operate at speeds as little as 5 miles per hour and delays continued to multiply. The lack of cash also caused track maintenance to drop. Derailments became common. This sounds eerily similar to what was happening with the Penn Central. This was again another example of one business not learning from another business's mistakes and repeating them all on its own for no good reason at all. This situation basically demonstrated and or proved the theory that experience is not a guarantee nor a deterrent for success in a railroad. The components of success are based upon the attitudes of the employees and the management to work together as well as that railroad's ability to attract new customers and keep itself efficient. Although in this case, Guilford really didn't understand the rail business and was just trying to operate it as if they had galvanized bus drivers running their locomotives and basically viewed their employees as nothing more than necessary expenses. The pushing and shoving ultimately caused the whole strike to spiral completely out of control. By 1988, as it became very clear that Guilford was not going to get the concessions it needed from the unions operating in the DNH to make the company profitable, it decided to simply cast the DNH aside, declaring it bankrupt and abandon it. It promptly petitioned the ICC for such a move. The ICC, however, added a stipulation demanding it give the company to the employees of the DNH. Guilford, desperate to get rid of the dropped anchor that was the DNH, agreed to these terms. As such, the ICC then contracted the New York, Susquehanna, and Western, aka the Suzy Q, to operate the DNH railroad. The Delaware and Hudson would be operated by the Suzy Q for a year beyond this period in time. Then, after a year of dealing with operating the DNH, the DNH employees decide to sell the company off to CP Rail, aka the Canadian Pacific. As for Guilford, this strike would leave a permanent black eye on the company, not just between itself and its employees, but also on its shippers. Companies remembered having to wait way too long to get traffic through and began to treat the company as an outfit that just didn't know how to operate itself efficiently and not the first choice in transportation. The end result, Conrail got more business and Guilford continued to lose more of its own business. On top of that, the line side industries that still existed in the main central continued to dry up as again, they were now competing with overseas businesses set up in China and or set up in the South with more favorable labor rates. The end result, the company basically slowly but surely began to die off. This, plus continued disputes with the local communities the railroad operated around, including the disposal of such things, for example, as used railroad ties that were soaked in creosote, not being properly recycled, continued to cause public relation boondoggles for the company that it just couldn't seem to shake. And so in 2006, the company decided to change its name. The name choice was Pan Am. And yes, I did say Pan Am, that Pan Am, the airline Pan Am. Guilford had bought out what was left of this now charter airline in 1998. 
Unfortunately, this was yet another disaster for the company, and it was shut down roughly a year later. The company, however, retained the intellectual properties of this corporation, including the logo. And so, in a very ironic move, one of the world's oldest names in airlines became a railway company. This rebranding didn't help the company very much. In 2009, Pan Am Railways, as the company was now known, was ordered to pay one of the highest criminal fines in Massachusetts history of $500,000 due to a massive spill of diesel fuel which the company had failed to report. The company also suffered again from the same labor relations and local community issues it had before. In short, Pan Am Railways was a case of say the to the new boss, same as the old one. It did nothing to really help the company's image, and essentially it was more the same old, same old. While one would have thought the company was going to simply fade into obscurity at this point, something strange happened in 2008. The Norfolk Southern Railroad, mentioned earlier on in this story in Part 1, had by this point acquired half of Conrail, the bigger half. One of the sections it didn't own, however, was in the Northeast United States, specifically a line from Massachusetts into New York State. This line was critical to allow it to compete with CSX, which owned the original Conrail section of this line. Pan Am still owned trackage in this area that would link the two states, from Reiner Dam Junction, New York, to Air, Massachusetts. But the line had fallen into obscurity due to lack of service. This is a part of the old Boston and Maine system. Pan Am lacked the cash to upgrade these tracks to make a system and or corridor to the level that Norfolk Southern was looking for in order to allow it to compete with CSX. And so the two companies announced in 2008 a partnership and or agreement to form a new line called the Patriot Corridor connecting Massachusetts with New York. The line would officially be known as Pan Am Southern, a separate division of both Pan Am and Norfolk Southern. On March 12, 2009, Norfolk Southern, after receiving STB, or Surface Transportation Bureau, approval for the deal, transferred $137.5 million into Pan Am, which gave it a 50% stake in the new company. Noteworthy, this mainly consisted of property and other such assets, not cash. The other 50% would be retained by Pan Am Railways. The old beat-up line would be upgraded to high-speed standards, with clearances improved to allow double stacks to run side-by-side -side in both directions. A new intermobile facility would also be constructed with the help of state grants, and other such grants would also be utilized to help pay for all the track upgrades. It now looked like Pan Am Railways had finally found something to make itself less obscure, as Norfolk Southern was definitely a great partner to partner up with. Norfolk Southern in an interesting turn of events again, would acquire part of the former D&H Railroad from CP Rail to further complete its connection within the New York State area, allowing for complete access to its original main line that it had acquired when it broke up Conrail straight through to Massachusetts. Then, in 2021, Pan Am Railways announced it was up for sale. No specific reason was ever clearly made for why this happened. Some speculation indicates it may have simply been the age of the owner of the railroad, in any case, the railroad announced it was up for sale. CSX became the buyer of the company after a second attempt was approved by the Surface Transportation Commission. The Department of Justice, however, took issue with one of the critical terms of the sale. 50% of Pan Am Southern would again wind up in CSX's control. Again, CSX already owned the other main line going through this area, the former Conrail line. This would in turn give the company technically a monopoly on this particular section. CSX has proposed a solution to this issue, leasing this particular part of the railroad out to Genesee and Wyoming's Berkshire and Eastern Division, who would in turn lease and operate this particular line, thus removing any conflict of interest and or monopolization issue. However, the DOJ is expected to recommend that the 50% stake in Pan Am Southern be sold before the company is actually taken over, thus allowing another company to get control outside of CSX of these lines, as if CSX were to get 50% of this line, it would own almost all of the lines going through the region, including the former Conrail line. As for the DNH, it remains largely a CP rail operation, with the exception of one segment being sold to the Norfolk Southern to connect the Patriot Corridor to the 
rest of the Conrail line which Norfolk Southern owns. Essentially allowing it to own all of its tracks and not have to rely upon CSX, its direct competitor for access to this region of the United States. It'll be interesting to see how this merger works out if Pan Am Southern does get sold and or if perhaps Norfolk Southern is able to buy it, as things are going to get very interesting with the Pan Am Southern Corridor now up for grabs and causing some stipulations in the merger. Again, as of the making of this film, these terms have not been hammered out, so we'll just have to wait and see. And that's going to do it for this video. I hope everyone enjoyed it. This was a lot of fun to make. It also took a lot of time. So if you really enjoyed watching it, I encourage you to leave a like and subscribe as that will help me greatly. Also, please check out the YouTube channels of those who have helped make this video by letting me actually use their footage. Thank you to all who allowed me to use their footage. I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you very much for watching as always, and as always, keep the metal side down.